Did you just guzzle that on mic? Who, Peter? Somebody popped a can and was guzzling on mic. I think that was a Pedro guzzle. I didn't pop Peter? a can. Oh. I might have, maybe I, maybe I guzzled on mic. I don't have a can, though. Hmm. Something fishy. No, How's I hear it drinking? again. I hear it again. Who just drank? Better? Who just uh, drank? That was me. That was me. That was me that, that was time. definitely you both times. Okay. I recognize that guzzle. <laughs> I have to go close my window, even though it's 85 degrees in my house right now. I... Gross. I'm back. Fewer black t-shirts on than Are normal. Are you guzzling again, Sean? Just a little guzzle for you. Jesus Christ. Actually, I'm glad you're hydrating. Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive, common, and underappreciated records that are waiting to be discovered. I'm your host, Sean Hartman, joined by my regular co-host, world-famous somnambulist rhyme author, Jeremy Ruggles. I don't even have to think about it. They just come to me. Don't you doubt it. (laughs) A <laughs> natural. <laughs> he said that in his sleep. What's that, guys? He said huh? that in, well, sleep. I'm glad that you both know what somnambulist means. And of course, the other person on the microphones is world famous Shetland pony dressage master Peter Cook. Yeah, it's a Shetland out there right now. That's what everybody in your line of work is saying right now. Yeah, pony up. <laughs> Ooh, there it is. Jeremy. Yes. I heard that you've got a record that you want to talk about today by an artist who was listed as the primary influence for Eugene McDaniel's 1971 album, Headless Heroes of the Apocalypse. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. That's one way to frame it. Well, I have been wanting to do a, an album by this artist since day one when you first were like, Jeremy, I got this idea. Will you do all the recording and mixing for it? I'll let you talk too. And I was like, oh, I know who I'm going to do an album. And cool. uh, then I saved it because I wanted to keep it as a special thing for our live performance that could not materialize due to world events. And now it's spring and I'm just feeling that glow.
I really like that it's a really smooth song there. Great opening track. And what's especially funny to me is there's, you know, this, the structure is generally pretty straightforward during the singing, but then there's those breaks where it's kind of funky and almost sounds, with, with the vibraphone, it almost sounds like something off of those early 70s Frank Zappa albums, which actually had some soul influence to them, whether people want to accept that or not. Oh, I definitely agree with that. Sean, you had some details about the vibe player, the vibraphone? Yeah, I was looking into a couple of the the side players on this album, as I like to do on this podcast, and the vibe player has a lot of relatively standard association stuff you would expect to hear. Like he did he did a record with uh, Bill Evans, had some soul stuff, Ashford and Simpson, Van McCoy. But earlier in his career, he did percussion on the Columbia record by Moondog, the self-titled one in 1969. That's a classic. Yeah, it's an amazing record. Interesting association. Guys, that was Roberta Flack. Oh yeah, we haven't even mentioned that. Roberta Flack. Because Jeremy got so excited, he just started playing the song without even telling us. <laughs> Fucking with the format. I'm feeling that glow, boys. It does have that glow. It's spring. The sun is shining. We've awakened from our winter slumber. And uh, Roberta Flack. You guys ever heard of musical Prozac? No. No. I've heard some people use that to describe albums that they put on when they just want to feel good, shed the depression, and just feel good. And I feel like this album, pretty much from beginning to end, at least, you know, I, I wasn't familiar with it until the last couple days when I've been listening to it. And it was, it's a perfect spring album. Yeah, I would. Yeah, that makes a lot this of sense. This album is musical Viagra, though. Because <laughs> <laughs> of the make and love aspect. It's just sensual and smooth and yeah. Anyways, Roberta Flack, born 1937. She is 83 years young on this fine year. She was born in Black Mountain, North Carolina. Her mama was a church organist, and she started piano at the age of nine. She accompanied the Lomax African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, and at age 15, was one of the youngest ever to enroll at the prestigious Howard University and had a full-ride music scholarship. Did y'all know that? I did know that. Knew all, all about that. How'd you know? And then she, uh, she switched majors from piano to vocal. Correct. She started her graduate studies at age 19 and then took a job teaching after her father passed away. She dropped out of graduate studies and began teaching music. Yeah, she was an educator before she was a popular musician, from what I saw. Yeah, for years from that point, she was teaching and then moonlighting in D.C. clubs, just playing shows at night and on weekends eventually was asked to perform regularly at a place called Mr. Henry's, which was a fairly prestigious club. And she told the club owner, if you can give me three nights a week, I'll quit my teaching job. So that's what they did. And she became a performing musician full time, yet still kind of on the just like performing live thing. No records recorded. Yeah, she was in her 30s before her first album came out. Yeah, she was like, how old would she have been? 32 when her first album was recorded. She was asked to audition for Atlantic Records and then proceeded to play like 40 songs to the, <laughs> to the record rep who then signed her on the spot. And she recorded her first album, First Take, and it was composed largely of first takes, and the entire album was recorded in 10 hours, which, for those of you who don't know how long albums take, 10 hours is insane. Yeah, 10 hours is pretty good for one song on a professional album. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, like, guitar <laughs> solos that people spend more than 10 hours recording. She did this entire album, and part of that was... She had been playing these songs for years in clubs 
and had them dialed in. Not to mention, she was enormously talented. She was a classically trained pianist and vocalist, but had flawless technique and talent and just laid it down in a hurry. It seems that she was pulling influences from a lot of different directions. I saw that on the early albums, she covered a lot of folk artists like Leonard Cohen and Bob Dylan and Buffy St. Marie. Correct. She occupied the space of doing folk and pop standards and soul songs and jazz and like reading and kind of watching interviews with her. It seems like it sort of isolated her in a way where no community really wanted to like embrace her because she was such a mix of everything else she like didn't belong to any certain genre which was a strength but yeah also it seemed kind of isolating and it seems like critics from whichever angle they're coming from have a problem with the other influences she had so it's part of what makes her music outstanding in my opinion is the multiple influences being blended together so expertly but it seemed to kind of hinder her as far as critical reception yeah the lines were drawn a lot more i feel like what you're just talking about with not having a community embrace her probably has a lot to do with why her records are generally so cheap i've only recently started actually listening to her stuff after having seen it constantly over the last decade of working in record stores and i kind of was thinking about that while getting ready to do this episode about how like I feel like I don't often hear people talking about her that much anymore. And, you know, obviously she was very popular at one point by the amount of albums that are out there, but it just seemed a little strange how much she has seemed to be forgotten in current times. Absolutely. She sold enormously well for quite a while. So her, well, her first album initially did not sell super well. But then a certain Clint Eastwood heard <laughs> her song The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face on the radio and had to find out who sang this song, called up Roberta Flack and was like, hey, I'm going to direct this movie and I need to use this song. And she was like, cool, go for it. So in his directorial debut, uh, play Misty for me. <laughs> he included the song, and then three years after that album came out, the song became a hit, and it became the Billboard Top Song of the Year in 1972. Yeah, we mentioned that on uh, me that Melanie episode that that was one of the number one hits, or close to the same time as Brand New Key. Correct. Have you seen Play Misty for me, Jeremy? No, I generally. Don't go out of my way to see a Clint Eastwood movie, to be honest. <laughs> Sean and I have both seen it. Yeah, uh, I was trying to remember if you were at the house when we were doing Clint Eastwood Wednesdays. I was living with you when you were doing the Clint Eastwood Wednesdays, and that was a very enjoyable, messed up picture. Uh, it's, it's such a weird one. I don't remember being aware that that was his directorial debut, but we were all just questioning why that movie got made. And <laughs> I had no it was idea. It a popular movie. That's the thing. That's what blew me away when I was reading that, too. I was like, wait a minute. People actually gave a shit about Play Misty for me? <laughs> like, enough to launch Roberta Flack's career? Like, who the fuck was watching that movie and enjoying it? Yeah. No, it was a hit. It was a popular film. So weird. Yeah. So that really launched her career. She followed it up in 1973 with her second number one hit, Killing Me Softly with His Love, which I'm guessing the... With his, with his love or with his with song? With his song. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. This has got me, uh, you know. You really did your research on this one, hey, Jeremy? Sorry, I'm just all worked up over here. <laughs> A little hot and bothered. In 1973... She followed it up with her second number one hit, Killing Me Softly with his song. I'm guessing, Sean, at least, you mentioned seeing her records around. You've seen this record, right? 
Oh yeah, it has definitely the coolest her record album jacket. To find. It's everywhere. Yeah, and it has the coolest record jacket yeah. of all time. Mm-hmm. Second only to the uh, record jacket for Curtis Mayfield Superfly. Oh, what's that one like? That's not it's, a bargain. It's a similar bin thing. Record. They both they both have a uh, a like cutaway gatefold, whatever it's called. Yeah. So the Roberta Flack one, it's like a piano that opens up. It's pretty wild. I love it. Apparently, there's a lot of controversy amongst the various people credited with writing that song, Killing Me Softly with his song, about whether or not it's about the Don McLean song, American Pie. Huh. I don't know if either of you have ever heard about that. I have not heard about that. The only thing I know about that song is that it was referenced in the intro to Old Dirty Bastards, Return to the 36 Chambers, the dirty version. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only thing you know about that song. Yeah, I was hoping you had some kind of a Tupac reference you could follow that up with. <laughs> no, I mean, I, for me, that song was popularized by the Fugees when I was 15 because the score came out around then and they did it or... I guess you'd call it a cover. It's kind of a reimagining of that song that was huge and all over the radio in 1996. Yeah, I was I was always more of an old dirty bastard boy than a Fuji's boy. Ah, yes. Well, you know, got to pick your sides, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Killing Me Softly, in popular lore, the song was written about witnessing Don McLean perform American Pie live. It was not written by Roberta Flack. I can't remember the songwriter's names, but there's this huge debate amongst the different people that wrote the song who contributed to it about whether or not it's actually about that to the point that like someone tried to tell Don, like one of them tried to tell Don McLean to take down from his website that, that uh, Roberta Flack's killing me softly with his song was about (laughs) American pie. Oh, wow. And it's, it's bizarre how much back and forth there's been over that. I don't know where it currently stands. Got some heavy artist beef going on here. Yeah. Yeah, it's the original beef. Well, to loop it back around and really to put it in context, like you see these, like Sean said, you see the Roberta Flack records everywhere. That's how I initially found it was just, I think I bought Killing Me Softly because of the cool jacket on it. Fell in love with that album and just gobbled up every Roberta Flack album I came across for a while. Would you say that you've paid a dollar for any of them? I'd say I'd paid a dollar for basically all of them. Appropriate. In 1974, she signed the most lucrative record contract ever offered to a female singer at that point. So at this point in 74, she's the biggest female singer in the world. And now nobody knows who she is. Yeah, I I guess I had no idea that she, you know, I knew that she had a few hits, but I had no idea that she was that in demand that uh, record companies were offering unprecedented amounts to her. Well, they did, especially after hearing this next cut, Feel Like Making Love. That's when they backed up the truck full of money and said, get going, and this album is what she made. So here's the title track that won them over. Feel like making love. Also written by Eugene McDaniels. Strolling in the park, watching winter turn to spring. Walking in the dark, seeing lovers do their thing. Ooh, that's the time. I feel like making love.
Fantastic song. Agreed. Fully agreed. I'm with you. I was fully baffled in doing research for this. You know, I usually start in the Wikipedia to get like an overview of what's what. And in the Wikipedia, it describes the 70s and the end of the description of the 70s is like, killing me softly and then there's like a seven year hole that they don't say anything about and it jumps right into like her 80s career and it's baffling to me that they skipped this one but this record was her first record to not even sell gold or be certified gold so there was a lot of hype around it she'd sign this huge deal and then it did not sell like they expected it to Wasn't that song that we just listened to a big hit, though? Yeah, that song was a number one hit. It came out... But it probably just sold the singles? Yeah, it came out before the record came out. And the record kept getting pushed back because her regular producer previously, Joel Dorn, ended up quitting because she had brought on Eugene McDaniels to do some production. And then her and Eugene were not seeing eye to eye on where to go with the record. So Eugene left and Roberta ended up doing the production herself. Yeah, under a pseudonym, correct? Yeah, it's, uh, let me make sure I get it right here. It's It's like Rubina Flake or something like that. Yeah, Rubina Flake. It's also, she (laughs) credits the piano and keyboards to Rubina Flake, which is actually just her. As soon as I saw that name, I thought that has to be a pseudonym for her. That, <laughs> there's no way that someone with a bizarrely similar but different name produced the record. <laughs> yeah. So this was kind of a reflection of her taking more control. She was, a, from what I could gather, she was a perfectionist. I mean, she comes from that classically trained realm. And I forgot to mention this earlier, but when part of her agreement with Mr. Henry's when she was performing in the nightclub wasn't even signed or anything, she required them to put in this elaborate sound system upstairs and build the sound stage to have like proper uh, sound reinforcement for her performances. So that carried out into... From here on, she just started producing her own music because she realized she could. I found an interview where she's talking about this being another political act in her career insofar that production is a heavily, heavily male-dominated role in the music industry. So there are very few women doing it and even fewer women of color. So she wanted to step into that role and take control of the sound. That rules. I think this album sounds fantastic, too. Yeah, that's actually why I picked this album as opposed to her first three albums are incredible albums. The production is pretty straightforward on all of them, though, which makes sense to a degree because she has an incredible voice. So you don't need necessarily all the ornamental things around it. But this album was kind of a shift in the production style, I noticed. And I didn't know until doing the research that that's because she took over the production. But I love the production on this. Yeah, it's very consistent throughout, and it's kind of dreamlike. Yeah, and it accentuates her voice instead of distracting from it, I guess is what I really like about it. Well, that song we just listened to, we've talked about some of the other R&B records that we featured on this program from different eras having the quote unquote baby making music. And I think I'm going to say that that's probably the most tasteful one of those that we've yet featured on this podcast. That one it's laid back. It's sensual, but not overbearing. Yeah. I found out there's a word for this, the quiet storm genre. Have you guys heard that? (laughs) Yep. I remember t- I remember Tim Meadows on Saturday Night Live had a, a sketch that was him playing a, a DJ 
the quiet storm. <laughs> that was his programs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what came first that, that uh, sketch or the genre. Uh, actually the Smokey Robinson album, quiet storm came first. Ah, there, there you go. I think I actually, maybe he named it after the genre, but I always assumed the genre was named after that album. I guess I don't hundred percent know my facts there. The genre was in fact named after his album called the quiet storm. Ah, I was right. But Roberta Flack was embodying that style before that album came out. And I would say this album is that genre coming to full fruition as to where it was sort of a blend of elements. I feel like this album is one of those turning points to where it was unique in its construction, I guess. All right, guys, I have something for you while we're talking about this song. I think I could safely say that all three of us would rate this above Bad Company's song of the same name that was out right around the same time as this Feel Like Making Love. No contest. Yeah. Are we all in agreement? Yeah, I wouldn't even consider considering that as a question. (laughs) (laughs) Well, my follow-up to that is, is, is there a song you can think of that has a similar... The, the, uh, song, songs that have the same title that are popular that you would pick one o- controversially over another. Like, I would say that TLC's Creep is superior to Radiohead's Creep. Ooh, I, I can get behind that as well. I don't know if you guys can think of any others. I would agree. I can't think of an example like that off the top of my head, though. I'm just not that yeah, smart. I can't either. <laughs> Neither of us are on Peter's level. Well, I thought about it ahead of time, too. (laughs) You should have let us know ahead of time. We could have had a whole bit. Ah, missed opportunities. (laughs) Yeah, that's interesting what you're saying about the production change on that album, because I remember when I first heard some of her music, when I was getting into soul music, my initial impression was that it was a little bland. I liked some elements, but it wasn't really speaking to me. And then that was the first thing I noticed listening to this record in full, getting ready for this episode. It was just, wow, this is so much more interesting on the production wise and the instrumentation and arrangement. Like, was the other music like this and I just forgot about it? Or is there something special about this record? I would say from this record and forward, it's different production wise. Because, like I stated earlier, the early albums, which are the most common ones you'll find, had a very stripped down production value to them. Some of them were just her and a piano. I wonder if that has something to do with the folk influence. Yeah. She, for a while, she embraced this folk influence. At around the time this album came out, she moved into some fancy apartments in Manhattan, and her bedroom wall was the same wall as John Lennon's rehearsal space. They were two apartments right next to each other. Was that the Dakota? Uh, It's some ritzy place. (laughs) (laughs) But on top of that, she... Yeah, I had read that too. That was interesting. Yeah. On top of that, she also joined Bob Dylan for the Rolling Thunder Review. She was a part of that with Joan Baez, Robbie Robertson, Joni Mitchell, Allen Ginsberg. She toured around playing a handful of songs as part of that. So she was kind of embraced by the folky community for a little while in the mid-70s, but then from this album forward kind of turned more towards R&B and more kind of I don't know what to call it. Like, it's not pop arrangements, but it's not folk arrangements either. It's a quiet storm. Yeah, it's a quiet storm. Well, speaking of interesting arrangements, uh, were you going to feature the Stevie Wonder composed song on this one, Jeremy? Oh, yes, I was. That was one of the songs that really changed my view of what Roberta Flack can even do. It's like a 13-minute song. The song was written by Stevie Wonder and includes a pretty far-out ambient section. So I'll jump ahead to kind of the middle of the song so that we get some of the 
fire out ambient section in there as well. Yeah, I was wondering how we could cover this one because it's just such an, a lengthy track. This is, I can see the sun in late December. Correct. And if you like what you hear, go listen to the whole thing because I feel out of context it won't fully serve it justice, but we'll give you a little taste here. I can hear the stars. stuff there when i was listening to the when i was previewing the album i had never heard this before and that one just caught me off guard after listening to the album the second time i started to wonder if that track had been sampled by beat makers and hip-hop artists and a yes it has the earliest example i could find was the supergroup from Brooklyn, New York, called Boot Camp Click. Is that name familiar to either of you? Oh, absolutely. No. You know them, Sean? Yeah. They sampled it in 2007 on their track Casualties of War. And that was the only one I could actually find an example of people rapping over the track, the, a track that this song was sampled on. But Someone called Bug Seed sampled it in 2014 and GraphWise in 2015. And then a Chicago producer named Thelonious Martin has used it on multiple tracks. And of course, in each instance, it feels like it was a different section of the song. That psychedelic section, I felt like the bass would be a really great thing to sample, except, except by the time that comes in, the track is really covered in a lot of other stuff. So I don't know if you could get a good sample of just that bass part. Yeah, I'm not sure how you would, yeah, work that into a, uh, you know, there's no space to put any more stuff in it. It's pretty full out. <laughs> yeah, it's very layered. But man, it's successful. It, it it works so well. Agreed. It's such an interesting transition from the beginning of the song. I was thinking about how the start of it is just got that perfect stevie wonder feel that kind of indefinable songwriting style that he had and then to transition into the more like far out quiet storm area it was just awesome it's a cool song very jazzy too oh absolutely well i mean pretty much all those motown guys were highly jazz informed anyways so it makes sense that that would fit easily into their repertoire true so i tried to find out about her personal life and you can't it's just not out there 
she I found out she was married to a guy, Steve Navasel, from 1966 to 1972. He was a jazz bassist. And she also had a son who was born in 1963. And I had a really difficult time trying to discern if if uh, Steve Navasel was the father because that would have been three years before they were married and nothing really says one way or the other who the father is, which I, I suppose that's getting into like gossip mill territory, but I guess it just stuck out to me because want to do that. I couldn't, I just couldn't find anything about her personal life and watching interviews. Like the only thing they would ever talk about is her being a teacher previously. There's a lot of emphasis on that part of her life. Yeah, so it seems like she's must want that all kept very private. So that's why I don't have much information there. Other than her son, Bernard Wright, was also a musician. Also put out a few albums, including one that was hugely influential in the hip-hop world called Nard that was sampled oh. over and over and over. Including, you ready, Peter? Okay. Tupac. Oh, man, you got the Tupac connection before I did. Yep, his song Lie to Kick It is uses a sample of the bass from Bernard's Hebogloblobin. <laughs> but I listened Damn, good work, Jeremy. Thank you, thank you. I listened to Bernard Wright's album Nard also because I'd never heard of him. Have you heard that, Sean? Because I feel like it's right up your alley. I have heard it before. It's something I want to pick up when I can find it. I had no idea that there was the family association, though. I saw that she was supposed to, at one point in time, in the, in the early 70s, she was in talks with some film producers about starring in a movie about the singer Bessie Smith, that she was supposed to play Bessie Smith in a film that never came to fruition, that project. Yeah, I had seen that in an interview as well. They were asking her about it, but yeah, it didn't look like that happened. And as far as I could tell, she didn't act in anything that I saw, at least. She seems very considered in her in the interviews that I watched with her. She's just very thoughtful, I should say. Yeah. When I initially was considering doing Roberta Flack way back months ago when we were starting this podcast and I started doing a little preliminary research and there was very, very little information. And when I went back this time, there was a bunch of new articles from just a couple months ago because she won the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, this 2020 Grammy Award. So. I don't watch the Grammys. I didn't know that. But there is a whole bunch of articles that have come out just in the past couple months about Roberta Flack and her life. So that's cool. I mean, I'm glad she's getting some recognition. Yeah. In in those interviews, she comes across as incredibly intelligent and thoughtful. And someone was reflecting about how she seemed to display what we now call emotional intelligence and seem to be singing about it and displaying it in copious amounts many, many years ago before people were thinking about it in those terms. Yeah, I would agree with just the short clips I watched. Yeah. So she continued making hits, making albums through the 80s and 90s, made a bunch of albums with Donny Hathaway, doing duets that are... Mm -hmm incredibly good also love donny hathaway yeah she was part of the artist empowerment coalition for assisting artists in having more control over their intellectual property and is a spokeswoman for the aspca the american society for the prevention of cruelty to animals In addition, she also set up the Roberta Flack School of Music in the Bronx, which allows people with less means to be able to study music. That's pretty cool. 
Yeah. So it seems like. Don't give Roberta no flack. Yeah. She's a good person. <laughs> yeah. She seems like a super good person. Did all these like helpful things. Couldn't find any like crazy stories about her like. I don't know. Running over a pedestrian or who knows. I don't know. You know how these stars are. <laughs> get, yes, we do know how these stars are. You get none of that with They're Roberta out of control. Flack. Roberta Flack's thoughtful and in control and extremely good. Yeah, I really need to explore her catalog more. I'm glad that you brought this one to the table. I have neglected her work. I'm guilty. Yeah, I think. Same. I'm definitely going to have to go back and reevaluate all the records. Yeah, as I said previously, like she gets overlooked because she's not the figurehead of any genre, I guess. Like she was too technically capable for and too polished for like rock music. She was criticized by critics for being too white sounding in R&B and soul circles. So she kind of didn't get she doesn't get celebrated in the way I feel like her catalog really deserves. Are either of you guys familiar with Ralph McDonald? With what? Ralph McDonald. I'm not familiar with Ralph McDonald. He's the percussion player on this record, and he's a jazz guy that did some other writing for other people, he wrote a song for Bill Withers, and then he played with like George Benson, David Bowie, Retha Franklin. I was actually wondering about the players on this record because the Wikipedia article didn't really have anything about them. Yeah, probably the most notable is Bob James. Oh my God, Bob James is on this and we didn't even mention it? Yeah, there's three keyboardists aside from her. Bob James, Harry Whitaker, who I don't know, and Richard T, who is a really good like smooth jazz crossover keyboardist. Incredible. Are there any similar artists to Roberta Flack that we can recommend checking out that might be dollar bin artists as well? You got like Dionne Warwick. I guess that's a little bit a little bit different, but similar-ish vibes. I don't really know Dionne Warwick's music. I remember that she was one of the people really campaigning against gangster rap in the early 90s. She would always appear on shows speaking out against music music companies releasing music of that nature to the public. That's, that's like how I first came to know who Dionne Warwick, Warwick was. Fine, I'll take it back. Just by yeah, Roberta I, Flack. I have yet to hear a, a Dionne Warwick record that I really enjoyed, but there, I'm sure there's a couple out there. Two comparisons I had thought of, well, a, a few. There's a lot of her career and style reminds me of Nina Simone. However, Nina Simone is definitely not a dollar bin artist. Uh, the other one that I get some similarities to is Minnie Ripperton, who's also not technically a dollar bin artist, but I feel like it's a lot more common to find her records really underpriced places. Oh, yeah. And then another figurehead of the Quiet Storm movement that doesn't get any love anymore is a guy named Michael Franks that has some definite similarities to what Roberta was doing. Excellent. Michael Franks. Well, it's time our listeners. Prepare themselves for the quiet storm ahead. That's just us uh, moving along and, you know, we'll be back next week, guys. Don't be afraid. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Deal with the storm for one more week. Well, this has been... Are you saying that this is the conclusion? This is the conclusion. And this has been I'd Buy That for a dollar. And my name is... Jeremy Ruggles. My name is Peter Cook. And my name is Sean Hartman. And I'm going to leave you with the song Mr. Magic because it also rules. Oh yeah, this is a good one. Good one to go out on. Good choice, Jeremy. Thank you for listening to another episode of I'd 
buy that for a dollar. We would like to ask you to follow or subscribe to us in your app. You don't have to keep searching us out, looking for us episode by episode. Just subscribe. We'll pop up. You'll be like, yes, a new episode. Hooray. Just go ahead. Click that follow. Click that subscribe. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Just a head.